Okay, and it's my honor to introduce you to Four Arrows and Vera Tupa for today's session. So welcome everybody. Well, hink pe topa amachi api elo mashanta tawo ugra ke na na pe chuse pe elo. I'm saying that my name is Four Arrows and that I offer everybody here a warm handshake and that I'll be speaking from my heart this morning. I'd like to uh, open with a Lakota prayer. Um, I am uh, uh, Irish and Cherokee uh, by blood. However, I am a made relative of the Oglala uh, Lakota and a long story, but that's my path. And so I speak, I will speak the prayer in Lakota. And essentially the prayer is reminding us that we are related to all the sentient life on this planet. The two leg, the four leg, the crawlers, the swimmers, the flyers, the rooted ones. And that we are here at this session to do our part to bring balance back into our world. Tunkashila, Wakantanka, Namakompo, Natatewa Topa, Na Unshimaka, Hitoan Yankelo. O Yate, O Yasin, Unchi, which Alapo, no Oichakipo, Hetcho, which was only washed, only a big deal. O Yate, O Yasin, Chanko Luto, Ochlamani, Oichakipo. O Kichia, Makio Kipi. I um, want to say that it's usually more significant to speak not to the choir, but to those who are not understanding the things that we're going to talk about as well as I think all of you do. But I have to say it feels really good to be surrounded by, by people that have joined this that I know um, uh, already understand the importance of what we're going to be talking about. So I'm hoping to get into a dialogue very quickly because uh, I'm going to offer some profound and some controversial claims that I, I hope will uh, be responded to with questions and requests for clarifications and maybe even some, some good uh, healthy arguments. Uh, the claims that I want to make, um, there's, there's, there's five of them. One is, and I will come back to them. One is that indigenous world view is the foundational solution to rebalancing our life systems on this planet. The second one is that there's only two observable operating worldviews. That may be the most controversial of them since most scholars think that there's uh, a lot more. Three is that place-based indigenous knowledge and indigenous worldview, although they're intrinsically related, are very different. And it's important to note that difference. Four is that indigenous languages and sovereignty are vital. And uh, the fifth one is that the cat fawn connection, mnemonic, uh, that came to me uh, on the Rio Uric River in central Mexico during a near death experience is a dehypnotizing tool for worldview reflection and transformation that I want to introduce you to that can help us move away from our dominant worldview that's creating the imbalances in our world. So let's launch into it, right? Um, uh, the, uh, I'm gonna share my screen just for a moment. Well, I actually I won't now, I'll, I'll just uh, read uh, something for, to you. I wanna talk about the importance of, of uh, this first idea that um, indigenous worldview is this solution. This is certainly not a new idea. Um, uh, some of the great American philosophers, including 
being uh, Henry David Thoreau and, Ab and Abraham Maslow, although they never said it, uh, the research is clear that they gained their ideas on humanistic psychology and philosophy directly from indigenous peoples. Um, but more recently, we have uh, David Suzuki, Noam Chomsky. Uh, I could, the list is very, very, very long. Of, who are saying things like Noam says, if we do not embrace the wisdom of our traditional people, we are doomed. That's a direct quote from, uh, from one of the most cited authors in the world. Well, what is a worldview? The most scholars see it as a set of beliefs about fundamental aspects that ground and influence our perceiving of uh, our thinking, our knowing about who we are in the world and what our relationship is. Um, uh, scholars have, like uh, Anne uh, uh, Hedlund DeWitt from the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development, say that insight into worldviews is the most important thing that we can be doing today. And it's essential for approaches aiming to design and support sustainable pathways. Edgar Mitchell, who was the seventh person to walk on the moon um, and founded the famous Institute of Noetic Sciences, uh, his research suggests that worldview is the most important educational goal that there is. Now, it's not coincidence that Edgar Mitchell, when he looked down on Mother Earth from his spaceship, from the moon, he had an epiphany that caused him to quit the NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to found the Institute of Research of Spiritual and Phenomenon. And he said that only a handful of visionaries understands that indigenous worldview is the solution to the imbalances on this planet. He said that quite a while ago. So worldview is when you hear people talk about it, you hear people generally getting into things that are relating to a dominant way of being in the world uh, compared to the indigenous way. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen real quickly with you, if I may, to show you a worldview chart. And um, so that might be a little hard to read. Let me get a better one for you. So if you look on the left side of the chart, these are general beliefs that the dominant worldview institutions and our operations and behaviors within it operate according to. And of course, people that move over into the indigenous way sometimes, but generally speaking, the ones on the left is what the scholarship shows are primary. I'll just read some of them. Rigid hierarchy, fear-based thoughts and behaviors, living without strong social purpose, focus on self and personal gain, rigid and discriminatory gender stereotypes, materialistic, earth as an unloving it, more head than heart, competition to feel superior, anthropocentric, and there's about 30 more, right? And so these are all in, uh, in my most recent uh, book um, that, um, that was endorsed by Dr. Uh, uh, Shiva, but it, 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 I, I can send these to anyone who sends me an email. I'll send them right to you. So let me stop my, my sharing so I can see everybody again. Um, but well, let me give you one other, exa other example while we're, while we're on here. Um, uh, this was in a PowerPoint presentation that I gave that shows um, uh, three 
sentences about the importance of soil and earth. I, I gave this at a presentation with some uh, earth uh, soil scientists uh, last year. And when they were done speaking, I went last. And, and with re respect and humor, I said, well, what you've heard from these soil scientists is so important and so true. However, it's not going to do any good. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, they, we winked at each other. But what I show here on this PowerPoint is um, quotes from three people that uh, I respect that said some important things about soil. One was the president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Another is Mahatma Gandhi. He said, to forget how to dig the earth and to tend the soil is to forget ourselves. The other is the great environmentalist, Wendell Berry. He says, without proper care for the soil, we can have no life. Now, each of those is important, but the reason that I say they will not be sufficient for us to rebalance this, the earth today is because they're missing the indigenous worldview. In the indigenous worldview, we also know that it's important for the same reasons. But look at what Chief Seattle says about soil. I'll read it. Every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Even the rocks thrill with memories of stirring events connected with the lives of my people. And the very dust upon which we stand responds lovingly to our footsteps. Now, when I showed this to the audience, I asked the audience, can you see a difference between the first three and the last one? And everybody did and came up with things that I had not even thought of. It's about seeing the sentience, the soul, the livingness, and the love that is in the other than human life forms. That is such a missing link in our, in our world today. Now, let me go to the idea of uh, my other claim that there's only two worldviews. As I said, when people are discussing worldviews, they think that a culture is a worldview. They think that a belief of any kind is a worldview, frankly. Um, usually, though, it's, it's culture and religions that claim to be worldviews. However, the studies that I've done, and also that Robert Redfield, the first social anthropologist uh, from the University of Chicago, uh, did in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, is that although the East did represent a worldview, it became overshadowed with the dominant Western worldview. And what we find is that many diverse cultures under each worldview exist, have common denominators that really rise to the definition of the deep foundational, uninvestigated uh, worldview. It's, it's the water in which we swim. There's a joke that many of you may know about the old elder fish who's swimming in the, in the lake or the ocean and two young fish are coming toward him. And he says, hello, uh, young boys and girls. And as the two young fish go by, they, they're nodding him and, he's, and the, the old elder fish says, how's the water today? And as the young fish 
are out by themselves, they look at each other and they say, what is water? That's what a worldview is. It's often uninvestigated. And so there's a great diversity of indigenous First Nations with very different spiritual traditions and a great diversity of, of, of um, cultures under the dominant worldview. But they possess those 40 precepts that I showed you in the, in the chart that makes the worldview boil down to their only being, being two. All right, so the, um, the third uh, important claim is a difference between place-based knowledge and this worldview that we've been talking about. In many ways, I think place-based knowledge is the most important and it's also what I know the least about. Um, Place-based knowledge requires growing up in one place with one culture and with an indigenous language because indigenous languages are from the land and they give the knowledge of how to live in that land. So those of us who were not raised in that special way do not know our original languages well enough, do not know our ceremonies well enough. We cannot teach this place-based knowledge. This is something that requires us to find people who still have those things intact, which are becoming fewer and fewer. I know many full uh, speakers of the, of the languages have been colonized so much from boarding schools and cultural and educational hegemony that even the language is becoming colonized. But we have to start helping bring sovereignty, land rights, and language back into the primary focus of our work. Where it does not exist, we have to encourage it to be rebuilt. And where there is no one left there to rebuild that is of the culture, we have to re-indigenize ourselves to place. And, and, and so I believe though that as important as this place-based knowledge is, we have to start with the worldview that stemmed from it, that is shared by indigenous cultures and by many people on this call. And so the last claim is that I have uh, a way I want to offer that I'll talk briefly about called the cat fawn connection that can be very useful to help all people, including I have many, many indigenous students uh, and, and they are benefiting from it even those who speak their, their language, but who have forgotten many ceremonies and many constructs that have been overridden by the dominant education system. And cat fawn stands for, uh, uh, the first one is cat, C-A-T. It stands for concentration activated transformation. A more, a more common way to understand that is the phenomenon of trance-based learning or self-hypnosis. Indigenous cultures have long used this phenomenon of cat or trance-based learning or hypnosis, uh, knowing that it was a requirement to reach full potential. Ceremony is an example. All hypnosis is, is moving into a different brainwave frequency, a different level of consciousness and having intention and having an imagination for what it is that you want to move into. Essentially, this is ceremony through songs, through chanting, through various other 
ways of achieving trance and focusing on a particular outcome. We've done for tens of thousands of years. And so it's important for us to remember that many of the problems we have today are because we have been hypnotized by authority figures and have been hypnotized into living in uh, an out of balance way. That brings us to Fawn, F-A-W-N. Fawn represents the four major influences that dominant worldview and indigenous worldview uh, conflict with. Fear is F, A is authority, W is words, and N is nature. And in brief, the dominant worldview does not like fear. It avoids fear. It, it is paralyzed by fear. It uses fear for violence and anger and inaction. In the indigenous way, once the fight or flight mechanism has done its job and we have done what we need to do, after that, fear becomes an opportunity to practice a virtue like generosity, patience, fortitude, humility, honesty, or courage. And we can talk more about that, of course, too. The third one is words. In the dominant worldview, words have become used for deception. Words are sacred vibrations in indigenous ways. There's a wonderful book called A Time Before Deception that talks about how when the Lakota and other American Indian tribes were lied to by the Europeans, we thought that they had a mental illness and we prayed for them because they could not describe reality. Uh, nature, of course, we know. Nature is our teacher. All that is in nature is our teacher. We are part of nature. And yet the dominant worldview sees the hum humans as superior to nature, as in control of nature, or sees natural uh, things in nature as resources as opposed to relatives. Well, that's the, the most uh, brevity I've ever done in, in putting those five things. Each one of them is a weak uh, workshop. But um, I wanted to see if by starting with those five claims, that that would be enough to stimulate any questions before I go on to give more detail about uh, the cat phone connection. So let's open it up and let me look and see if there's anything in the chat box. If you want to, if you prefer to write it, um, uh, that's fine. Or if you just want to blurt it out, that's fine too. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. I'm looking at the chat box. Yeah, I've got a question on the top of my head. Super. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for the sharing. It's brought up a lot of memories and reminders and um, a question around language. So given the English language, can words be added that would enable this indigenous way of being or that would enable this worldview? Or can anything be done with the pre-existing language to change it or to make it more connected? Uh, well, I, I, that's just a brilliant question. And it's one that has been on my mind for the past few months uh, in a lot of discussion. So thank you, Dan, for that question. Um, uh, yeah, because you know my thoughts on it are, are probably like yours. Is, well, wait a minute, if we're speaking German or French or English, does that mean we're screwed? <laughs> right? And, and, and so come on, you know, the, the English language is also uh, beautiful. So I said, you know, just look at Shakespeare. So what my thoughts on it are this, the answer to your question is yes, we can. If we look at, I believe, the English language, uh, let's look at, say, pronouns. I think it's fair to say in a sort of a cliche way, 
that we are itting our world to death. Do you know what I mean by that? You know, when we, when we refer to buffalo and whales and ants as it, when we refer to almost anything that is not a human being as it, we are already desanctifying, being disrespectful, creating hierarchy, right? So as something as simple as that would be an example of how absolutely we can. Um, we can also, because indigenous languages are verb-based, they're in motion, uh, uh, and uh, our European languages are, 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 are noun-based. So I also, and that this is all researchable, something that is more hypothetical is, I believe that the European languages were founded, which were, came about around eight, 9,000 years ago, were based on the new social hierarchies that were structured. So that they're based on hu humans. I mean, the father of Western philosophy, Socrates and Phaedrus said, I cannot learn out amongst men, uh, the trees. I, I must learn in towns amongst men, right? And so I think the language was based on the materialistic ways, not the spiritual ways that came from nature. If you walk through British Columbia, where I live in the summer, I couldn't get there this year because of COVID. And so we stay here in Mexico. But if you walk across British Columbia, as soon as you, and you're very observant, as soon as you start to notice a different uh, flora and fauna and different sounds of birds, you'll know that a whole new language, another dialect, another First Nation occupies that area. The language reflects that carefully, the, the, the nature. So if you're living in downtown London or Chicago or wherever, and, and you have no access to indigenous wisdom or people that still remember any of the local languages, many of the tribes have disappeared forever. Can we re-indigenize ourselves? Starting with, and I think it's brilliant for you to, to, to suggest this, with, with look, we, looking at our language. I think, I think that is a starting place. And, and I hadn't really thought about it as a starting place until just now, but it could very well be a starting place. So thank you very much. I have Somebody a question. Else? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, hi, I'm Daniela. Hi, Daniela. Uh, I I came. I thank you very much for your presentation and the text you shared. I got in an email from you before, and I found it very, like, with the different worldviews. And I think you sent in the Acoversities mailing list for a while ago, and it was really Super. nice to see. And I've been sharing it around. One expression I'm now have working with. It's the idea of word view, because I came across the idea of word sense as a way that um, contests the uh, hegemony of sight, as we have in our culture. It doesn't mean only a sight; it means also words like the literacy we are in our westernized world. So I don't know if you could comment or if you are familiar with this concept of word sense, because I think in um, in anthropology where I found this. They are looking at non-Western uh, uh, cultures where other, other senses are much stronger. Perhaps this affiliation to the land can be also connected with these other senses that we over uh, see, <laughs> we, over, we undermine them because of uh, our specialization on sight and hearing and we forget smelling, touching and um, it's, it's, um, how do you call it? flavor or, but even uh, this balance, these other, there are other senses that beyond the, our naming of the five senses that perhaps would be more helpful if we start, start uh, stop using word view and start using word sense. How, how is your position about it? Thank yes, you. well, thank you. Thank you for the question. In my uh, 2008 text, Unlearning the Language of Conquest by the University of Texas, I have an entire chapter, it's the last chapter uh, because the book is about indigenous world view. The last chapter is, um, I'll just show you real quickly. I'll tell you what it is. Um, and, you'll, and you'll get a kick out of this. The last chapter is called On the Very Idea of Worldview and Alternative Worldviews. And it starts out to say, 
the first thing to be pointed out is what a terrible word this is to use to describe indigenous worldview, right? So there it is. So you know I'm not kidding, right? And there's a, and there's the book, right? And so um, it, it, we have, uh, I say we, me and other colleagues over time uh, uh, have, have looked and looked and looked and looked for alternatives. Uh, Stephen Langdon uh, has one called Existence Scape, Existence Scape. <laughs> that I like a lot. And it's very specific to the Tlingit people, um, but it's much more about the place-based knowledge that I referred to earlier, as opposed to this larger thing. And so indigenous uh, worldview is a, is a very poor uh, use of Weltanschauung, the, the German, you know, the German word, um, because indigeneity is not about visual. It is, it is sensing the world. It's about listening and hearing. Our eyes are meant for other things than, than learning. So everything that you said I, 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 is, is true. Okay, so then, well, then why the hell are you still using the word worldview in everything you write for, Eros, is your question, I hope. And, I, you know, and, and here's why. Um, uh, let me give an example. I, I, I wrote a book a while back on emergency hypnosis. How when people, all creatures, including horses, if you guys go on YouTube, put in four arrows, wild horse hypnotist. I learned most of this from wild horses. <clears throat> so Prentice Hall published a book that I wanted to write about how an emergency scenes, a first responder can get a patient to stop their bleeding because during stress, all creatures become hypersuggestible to the communication of a perceived trusted authority figure for better or for worse. And I was teaching hypnosis at UC Berkeley at the time for marriage counselors certification. And um, I wanted to use the word hypnosis, but the publishers wouldn't let me because it's got such baggage. So the name of the book is Patient Communication for First Responders. Well, over, over the years, I've, I've, re, I've regretted it only this way. If you want to learn what scholars have written about hypnosis, but you don't have the word hypnosis to rely upon to go look at it, you're missing a, on, out on volumes of information. Same with worldview. As it, it's, we have to... And I, in all my books, when I talk about worldview, I give the preface on why it's such a bad word. And I, and I say all the things that you said. But if I didn't use it, it would erase this amazing work that is out there that's talking about the depth of us understanding how we are in the world in all of the ways that they're talking about. Because when people, scholars, especially in the last 10 years and, and from the Institute of Noetic Sciences, when they talk about worldview, they don't talk about it from that, that perspective. They talk about it from the, the larger perspective. So that's the best answer I can give, but very observant. Anybody else? And that may not be satisfying, right? But, uh, and, and, you know, if you use the, the language that you said, word sense, instead of worldview, I think that's limiting. I think that although we do think in words and words are important, I think that it, 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 it doesn't do as much to get a sense of, of the world it's, itself. It's focusing more on, on what humans will tend to think as humans uh, because humans use words. Do you see what I'm saying? So it has a limitation also. Okay, somebody else. Yes, <clears throat> hi. Thank you. I would like to uh, ask you if you could delve a little bit more into this sort of uh, dehypnotizing cat technology. Uh, you mentioned it a little bit on the passing. It sounds well, think about this. Does it make sense that any reasonable person would poison their water, poison their air, do what we're doing to Mother Earth to put us into an extinction? No, it doesn't. So what, what is, the, is the reason? Well, 
it's colonization. But where does that come from? How come we believe these things? We know the first five years of life, we are essentially in a hypnotic state. That's why you can learn 10 languages if you grow up with 10 people that speak different languages, right? But hypnosis is something that occurs, especially during fear, as I mentioned. So much of it is early childhood, but hypnosis is a phenomenon that the wrong people are using. We're, not, we're taught in the Abrahamic religions that it's something of the devil. We don't learn it in school. Some medical doctors use it. My book was actually banned by medical doctors because they said that first responders shouldn't be using it. Hypnosis is natural. That's why I say I learned it from wild horses if you go to the YouTube thing. And so self-hypnosis is how we're going to transform our beliefs not by paying somebody $300 to do it for us, but by using this natural way. And, and, and it's so simple. You know, we use it all the time inadvertently. Uh, uh, so we can use it intentionally. One simple way is to simply take um, a, uh, a pendulum of some sort. Uh, and I got one just right, right here. I mean, this is the easiest way to know when you're in hypnosis, because think of this as a definition. Hypnosis is simply believing deeply in an image that you have in your mind when you are out of a brainwave frequency we're in now, which is beta. So as soon as you go into a different brainwave frequency, if you begin to deeply focus on an image, and you get practiced with that, that image becomes a, a transformation of your neurons until with practice, it becomes a transformation of your behavior. This is why every gold medal athlete in the Olympics uses sports psychologist. I'm a sports psychologist. In fact, Natalie Molhausen, who is the first woman in Brazil to ever win a gold medal in, in the uh, fencing, and she, this was last year. Uh, she is one, one of she was one of my students, uh, and she used used hypnosis, right? And so we got to start to use it to transform into the worldview things on the other side of the chart, so we can be start to look at an ant in a different way, right? So a simple way is you just take a pendulum. And go ahead and move it with the muscles of your finger in a circle and look at it happening. So that is giving you the image to remember. Okay, now go back, make sure it's stopped. Have your elbow rested on the table is probably better than I'm, than I'm, I'm holding mine up for the video. Now imagine it going in a circle. All right, and that was hard to do in, on, on, on the video because I, I, I had to get out of my thinking about you guys for a minute. But you saw what happens is the ideomotor neurons in your fingertips are sufficient to move a light weight. A piece of dental floss and a paper clip works fine, by the way, okay? And once you, you get that, you know, don't, a lot of people will freak out and go, oh, what's happening? Or is the wind blowing? Or, you know, what's, you know, but trust it. Don't think about it because then you go back into beta. Keep it going in a circle. And you know now you are in a place to double task, which means to now have this other image that you want, that you've got clearly in mind. And that's positively stated in, in words. Now, after a while, you don't need to do that, but ceremony, like I say, is, is, an, is an alternative. And pretty soon you are able to do this because you know that subtle difference between consciousness. So hope that helps a little bit, Victoria. Well, you're gonna forget my ignorance, but I really don't know what happened. Could you explain? Sure. So I'll say it one more time, the, the ideomotor neurons in your fingertips only can move a pendulum when 
you go into hypnosis. Otherwise, it will just stay still, right? But when you see it moving, ah, you know that you are in this state of awareness that if you have another image ready to go, has to be ready to go because if you start thinking about it, you go out of hypnosis. But if it's ready to go, I want to be more engaged with my daughter, with my, I want to be able to, I, I'm, I am going to pick that cigarette up and throw it away. I mean, you know, whatever it is, it could be a million things. When you do that, you're doing self-hypnosis. And this is transformational. I had my appendix taken out with only self-hypnosis. So I imagined not being bothered by the pain. You know, people walk on fire. Have you ever seen that before? Yeah. They imagine that ability for doing that. So the only reason I show you the pendulum is it's just a simple way to know when, if you're just learning this, to know when you are in hypnosis. But the most important thing is to know if someone else is hypnotizing you. When you are in fear, you are in hypnosis. And if somebody comes up to you and says, you are never going to amount to anything, or you will never heal from that broken leg, that can become a hypnotic suggestion. So now think of all the suggestions we are being told when we are afraid from authoritarians that are causing us to live in ways that are killing our planet. Does that make a little more sense now? Good, good, good. Thank you. Mopila. So great. These are the, these are the, I got to say, these are the best questions that I've ever gotten from a, a, from a panel. This is, they are fantastic. So four arrows. This is Susan. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I can. All Hi, right. Susan. Good to so, see you, Susan. Thank you for you. being on the call. <laughs> Um, so actually, I had a question, but you just answered it. So now it turned into a comment. Um, I had heard you speak about the cat fawn in a, you know, another webinar thing. And I wanted to go back to the, this issue of we don't have um, a sense or we're losing the sense of the place-based knowledge and thinking of it in the ground. And one of the things that I found so helpful about the cat fawn and thinking about hypnosis and when you're saying that it's so central to us deprogramming or decolonizing our mind. One of the things that I found in my own process and working internally in this decolonization is the ground that I'm displaced from is my own body and my own senses and in using and being really mindful about that it's, it's, it reminds me of turtle medicine, yeah? So we're this multidimensional being as the earth. And as I connect with my own body and work through the trauma, and as I really get into my body and a lot of the pain and a lot of the trauma in my body and intergenerational trauma that's come up in the process, it's... Okay, we... I, we lost your we lost your video there right at the end, but I. All right, that that was my cat. Oh. Um, so yeah, he just stepped on the keyboard. All um, right, okay. It happens anyway, all the time. So, so what I was saying was, as I reconnect with my body, and really release the pain, and really release some of these hypnotic ideas and holding of the trauma and intergenerational trauma, it's connecting myself to my body, but also to the earth. And it's- That's right. That's because yeah. they, thank you, Suze, that, that they are inseparable as we know. That's, that's, that's it. So, I mean, this is, this is the theory of yoga, all right? 
Now, I see that the yogic traditions, and I participate I've, for years, my wife does, and the Kundalini yoga and stuff like that. Um, it, it's, it, it's a powerful way to reconnect through your body to the earth. I have a pet theory that says that the, 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 the uh, you know, these yogic traditions were postvention. They came about by founders who uh, in, the, in the great Hindu religion originally and in other Eastern religions um, and, and the Abrahamic religions who said, well, we got to get back to the indigenous way. You know, we've got hierarchy, we've got inequality, we've got uh, women's suppression, all this stuff, right? So they tried to create ways to bring us back. Whereas indigenous ceremonies are about um, prevention, you know, they, that's because we didn't have those, those problems, right? So, but, but it's a great way to do what you're, what you're saying. Walking and being in nature is the best way because then you are, you find how inseparable you are, you know, and you've seen me at some of my conferences where I have people go outside before they start and touch a tree and come back in. And then I have them go back out and I say, I want you to touch it again. But on the second time, I want you to ask permission. And, and, and when people come back in, it's unbelievable what they say about that interconnected inseparability between it. So, so yes, the place-based knowledge, um, you know, uh, is always a, a part of us. But if you're in downtown New York, in concrete and glass, learning about that interconnection with the natural world is much more difficult no matter how much yoga you do, right? Um, uh, so what do we have to do with that? We can't say people are gonna stop living in cities. Well, we get in touch with the nature we do have, which is ourselves, our breath, the insects that are in the pantry, whatever stars we might be able to see, other human beings and your cat, okay? So, so it's, it's, all do, it's all doable and it's a very good point, an excellent point you raise. For Eros, I'm gonna open, uh, um, Veratupo will speak. Um, hello everybody that hasn't been here from the beginning. We are doing a trilingual <laughs> uh, session. So Vera Tupo will speak in Portuguese and I will translate into English afterwards and Gerardo will translate it to Spanish in the subtitles. Pode abrir, eh, pode abrir, Vera. É, da Ujo, Kutupurã, Anderuntapá, Taikomare, é... Bom dia a todos, fundados, fundadas, guerreiros e guerreiras, é, que todos estejam bem, possamos realmente é, ouvir o nosso espírito, o nosso coração. Mas antes de eu falar alguma coisa, como tradição nossa indígena, é, Ouvimos primeiro os mais velhos, então foi é, muito bom ouvir o parente. E, e quero a, fazer uma pequena oração, uma reza, para conectar com o espírito dele, para que nós possamos, junto, é, elevar os pensamentos de todos nós, para que todos que aqui estão ouvindo possam ter a sua intuição. Porque a intuição nos dá é, a liberdade de sentir nosso, as nossas raízes. E aí as nossas perguntas não são perguntas, são coisas que são intuições e nós mesmos, porque nós não temos respostas, nós temos intuições. Então, vou fazer esse pequeno rezo para conectar com o espírito desse deixa, meu parente. Deixa, deixa eu traduzir antes, antes de você começar a oração, pode ser? 
I'm just going to translate. Um, so he said, uh, good morning, warriors in, in masculine and feminine in, in Guarani. I hope you're all well and that we can really listen to our, our spirit, to our heart. But before I say anything, as indigenous tradition, we listen to the, to the elder, to the older people. Um, it was really good to hear my relative and I want to do a little blessing to connect myself to him so we can together elevate what we think and therefore elevate everybody's thoughts so that we can have intuition because intuition gives us freedom to feel our roots and our questions therefore are not questions but it intuitions about ourselves they are our own answers so he will do the blessing now <laughs> coração e com o espírito tudo que nosso irmão nos disse é uma coisa muito importante para nós indígenas é justamente ouvir é, em nossas palavras gostaria de dizer para vocês duas coisas duas palavras que se fala muito nesse mundo, que é a palavra dúvida e a palavra amor. No nosso povo indígena, é, na, aqui no Brasil, a palavra amor não existe. Nós não temos essa palavra em nossa língua. Porque, a, porque o sentido da palavra amor está no sentir, está no observar, está no escutar, está no sentido de cheirar, de tocar, está no paladar, nos no nossos alimentos, nos nossos observar. Então... Seria muito importante que, se o mundo tirasse essa palavra do seu dicionário, a palavra amor, e sim, deixar que flua nos quatro cantos do universo, que é sol, terra, água e ar. Esse é o significado. É, a palavra dúvida pera, em nossos pera, deixa, corações deixa, indígenas... Vera Tupã, deixa, deixa eu traduzir, senão vai ficar muita coisa. Desculpa, só um minutinho. É, I'm just sorry, interrupting him, because otherwise it's going to be hard to translate. 
Um, so he said, Havete, which is thank you in Guarani. Um, she's, he said that listening with his heart and his spirit to everything that his brother told him, it's a very important thing for us indigenous. And just listening, deep listening. In our words, in my words, I would like to say to you two things that, two words that we talk about a lot in this world. Two words, doubt and love. Our indigenous people here in Brazil, in, uh, to our indigenous people here in Brazil, the word love does not exist. We don't have a word to love in our language because the meaning of the language, the, the meaning of the word love is in feeling, in observing, in listening, in to, to smelling, touching, tasting our food, and, and, and really observe. So he, it would be very important that the wor world would take out this word from the dictionary, the word love, and that really? would let it really flourish and, and let it really be felt through the four, um, four cantos, uh, four directions uh, of the universe, and also emerge from the sun, the earth, the water and the air. Terminate. É, e no, e nós, indígena, não temos a palavra dúvida, porque os nossos conhecimentos vieram através dos nossos antepassados, dos nossos tiramões, tijarins, avós. É, que nos falaram tudo aquilo que eles ouviram da terra, tudo que eles ouviram de suas raízes. E nós não temos dúvida quando eles falam. Por isso, sempre mantivemos a, a oralidade, a forma de ouvir e falar em silêncio. Para isso, essa grande importância de acreditar nas palavras. Porque quando as palavras soam da voz de um ancião, de um avô, de uma avó, é porque ela é verdade. E assim nós continuamos a ouvir e a falar essas palavras dentro de nós mesmos. E assim podemos agir, podemos nos conectar da melhor forma com, a, com o universo. E... E... Deixa, deixa eu ir, deixa eu ir. Um minutinho. Sim. So, um, here... Uh, we indigenous here also don't have the word doubt because our knowledge, our wisdom came through our ancestors, grandfathers and grandmothers that told us everything that they, they heard from the earth, from their roots. And so we don't have doubt when they tell us. This is why we always maintained oral orality uh, as a way of listening and speaking in silence. So the great importance in believing in words is that because when the words, um, when you hear the words of our grandparents or grandfather or gra grandmothers, it's because they are true. And so we continue to listen and speak those words inside ourselves. And so we can act and connect in a, in a better way to the universe. Terminate. Um. E agora podemos falar um pouco do, da forma que ele, nosso parente, é, falou sobre as conexões, sobre as terapias. É, e nós temos tudo em nossa volta. Se observarmos aprendermos, podemos aprender muito com a paciência, a 
paciência da formiga que carrega suas folhas até uma atrás da outra com paciência. So now I can uh, speak a, a little bit about what my relative here was talking about the connections and therapy and therapies, because we have everything around us. If we observe, we can learn a lot through the patience of an ant that carry the leaves one behind the other with patience. E elas carregam os só buscam seus alimentos quando a natureza é, está oferecendo bastante alimento para que elas carreguem antes de chegar o inverno. E assim podemos observar os pássaros que trançam, podemos aprender a trançar as coisas como um bordado que os pássaros fazem em seus ninhos. Podemos aprender é, o silêncio que a árvore nos, nos mostra quando observamos. Isso é, sim, uma grande terapia. Observar, olhar todo esse universo que nos foi dado, com esse olhar de, de a, aprender com aquilo que está in nossa volta. Okay. So you were saying um, the ants only uh, search for food and when, when nature is abundant enough, they're, it, it's offering uh, the, the different, the, the leaves before the winter. We can observe the birds and we can observe how birds weave their, I forgot the name of their ninhos, the nests. Nests. Thank you, Daniela. I have a support translator here. <laughs> um, we can learn from the silence of a tree when we are observing the tree. And, and, and obser observation is a great therapy. Observing everything the universe gave us to learn to look what is around us. É, podemos aprender com, com os pássaros a construir a nossa própria casa, como temos o pássaro João de Barro que constrói a sua própria casa. Essa é a capacidade que o universo nos dá de mostrar que somos capazes, que somos... Que somos é, fruto de aprendizado, de crescimento, em harmonia com tudo que está em nossa volta. Aprendemos com, com as águas que descem, os rios, os peixes que sobem para, para dissolvar, e assim eles acolhem o conhecimento e depois seguem seu caminho. E assim somos nós, observando a vida. Se observarmos todos esses caminhos, não precisamos de terapia, não precisamos é, é, de, desses meios de encontrar a nossa consciência. É, então, acredito que nós humanos temos uma grande capacidade que é de dar vida às coisas que estão paradas. É como você ver um objeto, como, como um, uma pedra estar num lugar e você colocar ela próxima à porta da sua casa e transformá-la num lugar para sentar e meditar. Isso é dar vida às coisas paradas. Esse é o grande dom que o ser humano tem. Por isso, é, nós não reciclamos as coisas, nós damos vida às coisas paradas. Essa é a maior sabedoria que nos dá a diferença, talvez, dos animais. Então, 
So we learn with, with birds how to build our own house. We have a bird here in Brazil called João de Barro that builds with mud it, uh, his house. The universe gives us capacity, the, the universe capacities to show what we are capable of, that we are the fruits of learning, of the harmony, of everything that has around us. We learn with the waters that flow down, we learn with the fish that flow up, that, 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 that swim upwards to save themselves, and they harvest knowledge and follow their path. And so are we observing the life. If we observe all these paths, we don't need therapies. We need ways, we don't need ways to find our own conscious consciousness. So I believe that what we humans have is a great capacity to give life to things that are paradas, to that are Danny. Uh, inanimate things that are stopped that don't move. Inanimate yeah. in English? Or that they are not moving. I think that it's, it might be better. Um, just one sec. So, for instance, a rock. A, a rock can be somewhere, and you put it close to your door, and suddenly it's it's a place to sit. It's a place to meditate, and so giving life to things that are that are in, inanimate are a gift of the human being. We recycle. We give life to things that are not moving, and our great and, and and maybe this is the greatest wisdom that we have, and that sometimes differentiate us from and from other animals. Okay. Até obrigado e minha beru possa nos intuir essa conexão que estamos tendo estamos tendo no universo nesse momento que estamos passando é, da, por essa por essa energia né que está vindo para nós que é essa nos, Covid, não, não sei dizer se é doença. Eu não acredito que isso seja uma doença. Isso, para mim, isso é uma transformação necessária para que possamos entender quem somos e o que queremos, e o que podemos para para nos conectar de novo a esse universo. He said thank you, and that may Nyanderu, who is God in Guarani, can uh, help us to, to have this intuition, this connection that we're having here with the universe in this moment, this energy that is coming to us, um, which is an invitation. Um, I, I believe what we have at the moment isn't a disease, but an opportunity, a necessary opportunity for transformation. So we can understand who we are, what we want, what we can do, and connect ourselves again to the universe. Thank you. Okay. Habite. Cantar uma música em Guarani para para agradecer a Yanderun e a todos que estão presentes para que abençoe todas as famílias que estão aqui presentes e aquelas He's going to sing a song in Guarani to Yanderu to God as a blessing for everybody that is here and to all the people that are connected to us in this life or others. Yanderu papá ropa pugua o mãe do amboente a cá de corria o amboente a cá Yanderu papá ropa pugua o mãe do 
बोए जाकाज कोई बोए जाका दे दू पापा हो पाप बुआ हो मे दू बोए जाकाज कोई बोए जाकार गुजरात गुजरात सुंदार गुजरात सुंदार अरे तक अरे तक Okay, Bia. I want to give I want to give uh, much thanks to my nephew. My I I want to thank him for his wisdom and for his words and for his songs. I want to share with everyone that I agree that the COVID nineteen virus is a a being that is here to help us. That it is here to teach us. to stop cutting the forests down and to treat animals with respect and because people are not listening i want to join with the song that he sang and sing a song just for him and his people Chankuluta ogna ma wan elo hel tumka shela pila ma elo hel chanu pa kile huya he waki kile tumka shela tumka shela. I want to thank everyone for the wonderful questions. Good day that. And uh we just had um a group of people here from Brazil and 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 Peru and uh I will share with them uh your your words. So Bianca um let me know when it's time to close and I want to uh to close with a uh a particular uh Cherokee uh uh idea and that's important for us to all remember. Yeah, well, I um felt invited to, uh, in the um when you were spoke at the at the beginning uh of, you know, argumenting and a little bit of controversy seems something you like. So I would like to put that <laughs> in the table. Um and that was wondering with this idea of the two world views if if maybe there's not some integration that is interesting more than choosing one or or the other um i have two at least two dimensions where i think integration may be interesting one is that the idea of community versus individual at least in the uh, in in the in, uh, experience i've had in mexico this is different of course from the native american uh, indians in north america uh, there are some communities in mexico where the community idea concept is so strong that the individual actually blurs out and there are some in my perspective and some uh, women organizations with whom i've had uh, 
the privilege to work with in some years, you know, some um, critiques about how in particular women are not, you know, are kind of blurred out. So the community is important, individual is not important. And in some communities, women are not very important uh, and are actually uh, discriminated. So, so there's, there's, two, there's, there's two things. First of all, complementarity is vital, seeking complementarity. The Andean uh, uh, natives uh, uh, say, have a saying that uh, everything has a complementarity. Everything that seems polar has a complementarity, except a few things. They always add that, which I love. <laughs> okay, so complementarity is, is vital. And yet, I, and I have this conversation often, if we're at a fork in the road and to the right is a cliff that jumps, that drops into a big canyon and to the left is the path to bring food to our people, you make choices. So the idea of complementarity as vital as it is, cannot be overplayed in a way that doesn't say, well, maybe it's better to be not anthropocentric, right? In terms of worldview. With that in mind, I think we always have to keep looking at what is the lesson? What is the thing we learned from the last 8,000 years of colonizing? There, there, there has to be some, something that still is complementary in that. So I agree with that. In terms of women, <clears throat> you know, uh, there's a chapter in my book called Where Are Your Women? I mean, we know that most indigenous cultures, most by about 80%, historically were matriarchy, matrilineal. Today, any experience with almost any, and I've lived with the Rarumuri of Mexico, I've lived with the Seri, I've lived with a lot of different cultures. The colonization effect, historical trauma, boarding schools, the vibrations of everything that is in the colonized world has like I said earlier, gotten even into the language of fluent speakers. And women is one example of that. Um, my studies have shown that even native studies programs are misguiding information or eliminating information that's about women. If you wanna read some good work on this, read Barbara Alice Mann, who has written extensively about this problem. So I think what you're seeing in the, this problem of individual and community is a product of colonization. Now, if, if you were, if you were 8,000 years ago, you would not have seen what you're, what you're experiencing now. Um, from the, I live with the Rarumuri Simiron people, not the Tarahumaras at the top that have been exposed to Christianity. And it's very, very different. The, there is no more autonomous individual than a traditional indigenous person. The autonomy and individuality is so strong. It's a misnomer to think that dominant culture is individualistic and in, indigenous cultures are collectivistic. No, autonomy and independence are vital. The difference is that with our independence, we care about others and is a priority. So there's a very fine distinction there that's very easy to, to miss when you see the, I mean, 70% of, of American Indians are Christianized today with a hierarchical kind of a way and, a, and women don't do well in the Christian religions. So I really appreciate all those, those questions and I hope that, that gives an answer. Um, we have two minutes and I wanna close with um, recognizing that I think we are in an extinction state, that I do not believe we're going to turn things around and that it doesn't matter that we um, uh, are in this situation in terms of continuing this work because our job is to become human beings and we are spirits in a body and we are here to honor this gift of the beautiful earth and its trees and its air and its water and its, and its creatures and we have to continue that work for future generations. 
maybe I'm wrong and maybe a miracle can turn things around, but I think we're doing this work for the, for the future generations. I don't think it's gonna be possible. But whether you believe that or not, we're in a lot of trouble and things are gonna get worse. We're not addressing the COVID-19 warning. Well, I wanna end on a positive note, which that is not. And the positive note is that during an equally horrible time, my blood people, the Cherokee, the Chalagi, were forced on a march called the Trail of Tears in which over a fourth died, they froze, they were beaten forced to walk 1500 miles from their homes into a foreign place in Oklahoma. But every night the mothers who the women have the, the women, we've got to bring the power of women back into our world. And this is an example. The mothers sang a lullaby to their children that reminded them that in spite of how difficult this is, did you see the beautiful animals in the clouds? Did you see the dancing grasses? Did you see the beautiful color of the fish in the brook when we crossed it? Did you hear the sounds of the birds? So I'm going to play that lullaby as we close out. And you can just kind of like a movie, we'll just fade out with the music. But when you hear the lullaby, yeah. know that the know that the lullaby is reminding us of seeing the beauty yeah. all around. So, sorry for I was just on check on. He would just like to mention something very quickly about uh, the uh, on the question that uh, Victoria um, made. Mm. Falando dessa pergunta que ela fez, né? por exemplo, é, antes da colonização dos indígenas, não havia cacique. O cacique foi colocado pela, pela colonização justamente para ter um controle dentro das aldeias, mostrando principalmente essa parte onde que o homem passou a, ser, a dominar dentro da aldeia. E as, as, a, quem comandava uma aldeia era o espírito da aldeia, que geralmente eram os xamãs. E esses xamãs sempre buscavam os conhecimentos e a espiritualidade através da, da sabedoria das mulheres. E hoje, dentro das nossas aldeias, principalmente aqui no Brasil, é, a espiritualidade sempre foi tomada pelas mulheres. Uma aldeia só é forte se ela tiver o espírito das mulheres fortes dentro da aldeia. E Então, quando agora que está voltando todos esses conhecimentos, muitas aldeias já sabem que a mulher hoje é, é a parte mais importante, então ela está se tornando cacique, está se tornando pajés, E, e, e estão comandando as aldeias. Na minha aldeia, a minha avó que comanda toda a espiritualidade e toda a, o conhecimento. Quando o, o mais velho fala, o homem mais velho fala, ele olha para a mulher, para a companheira mais velha dele, e ele fala no espírito dela. Um, so there you go. Let me try. <laughs> so he's just uh, saying that as um, before colonizations, the indigenous uh, the indigenous didn't have a cacique like a, a political leader, and that he was uh, this position was created to have control inside the indigenous villages, and that in this process the men started to dominate the village um, and and. Um, before that, it was, and who dominated him was this the, the spirit of that. Before that, who they used to live, listen to the shamans who were actually listening to the spirit of the village, and the knowledge and the wisdom that they were looking for was the knowledge and the wisdom of women. That women are the spirituality of of 
the indigenous villages and it was always women and so a, a strong indigenous village um, only is a village is only strong if it has uh, this strong spirit of women and that nowadays a lot of a lot of villages are realizing that and starting to have women in positions of cacique and page, which are the kind of the political and spiritual healing um, um, positions. And that has been changing. Um, and in the case he's saying in his village, his uh, grandmother um, is really the, the who, who, who commands the spirituality. And when men speak, they speak looking to their wives or looking to the older women, to the grandmothers, as a way of connecting to their spirit and to this wisdom. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment because you see the power of women. Actually, Vera Tupa is calling from his wife's <laughs> mobile. So you don't see his name. You see Jackie, which is his wife, who... who <laughs> who is a midwife, a medicine woman, and just an incredible powerhouse. <laughs> and so they are, they are uh, speaking together as, as, as the dualities, right? Ciao, queridos, Jacques Vera. Beautiful. And, and so keep in mind the very powerful, strong mothers, the women who, on this Trail of Tears, uh, would sing this song to their children to make them strong and remember that there's still beauty all around. And goodbye and thank you. <laughs>